Welcome back. I'm visiting here today with Lenny Mendoza, and uh, welcome to today's show. Thank you, Alan. So, Lenny, for the listeners here, can you give us some of your background, the history of, uh, let's start from uh, the college on up, the career path you had, and where you, what brings you to what you're doing today? Sure. So, I went from a dairy farm in Turlock, California, where I milked cows growing up, to um, Harvard. I was an economics and government major. From there, I went to McKinsey, spent two years at Stanford Business School, um, and I spent the bulk of my career in McKinsey in San Francisco and the last five years in Washington, D.C. So I was a, a senior partner and board member at McKinsey for a decade and um, was a consultant to businesses and governments and nonprofits around the world. You've had quite a, a diverse experience going from a dairy, dairy farmer up to a world renowned consultant there and you, and you were a chair there for I, I wasn't I was chair of their the McKinsey Global Institute which is the think tank that McKinsey has which mm -hmm. is the public research entity that that looks at the economies around the world and, and helps explain them and then produces reports and information about that you know McKinsey has always been known as one of the leading consulting firms in the world and uh, and, and so you were involved with with founding uh, the McKinsey's US state and local public sector. How did that come about? So McKinsey had done work in the public sector throughout its history, um, involved with a number of things, including the person who really built McKinsey, Marvin Bauer, helped Dwight Eisenhower organize his cabinet. Uh, McKinsey helped set up NASA going way back. They were instrumental in the structuring in the early days of Caltrans in California, but hadn't really done any substantial work in the public sector since the 1970s, when a group of us who had had some experience in the public sector, some of whom had been in government full time, and some of us, including me, who had done work advising government when they had a real problem, um, said that there was a real opportunity to make a difference in the public sector. So why don't we bring the kind of capability that McKinsey has to the private sector, to the public sector? And so uh, set that up. Um, Part of what I did during that time was to help build McKinsey's work serving governors and mayors and their teams across the United States. So that was the last five years that with McKinsey, that's what I did. Okay. So what are some of the projects and organizations that you're currently involved with after post McKinsey? Sure. So um, I loved my time at McKinsey, but I wanted to spend the next stage of my career more in direct public service. So I'm involved with a number of organizations that are engaged in trying to make government work better and trying to make the education system work better in particular. So I helped found and co-chair California Forward, which has been around for over a decade now, looking at governance and economic reform in California. We chair, co-chair and lead the California Economic Summit every year, which just finished uh, last month in Santa Rosa. Um, I chair New America, which is a national foundation, uh, national think tank that looks at nonpartisan solutions for big political issues. Um, I chair Children Now, which is a California-based education reform entity. And then I chair and co-founded Fuse Corps, which brings executive talent to mayors across the country. Lenny, it doesn't sound like you've retired in the least bit. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I retired from McKinsey, but I didn't retire from engaging. This is, it's fun. I love it. A amazing. Amazing. So as you go through and, and you're involved with several great organizations, I want to dwell back into the education mm -hmm. sector. What are some of the problems that you see today? So a lot of the work that um, I'm focused on is, student success. So what we're really uh, about that children now, and I'm also on the board of Western Governors University and the uh, College um, Futures Foundation in California are really all about ensuring that every child has the access to and is able to complete the kind of education that they need to have a successful life in today's economy. To me, that's the most important thing that we're focused on. It's particularly important in a place like California where the majority of students in the public education system are first generation students. Many of them are free and reduced lunch and have challenged personal lives. Many of them have English as a second language. 
they all ought to have the same access to opportunity and the great quality education systems that I had the opportunity to go through when I went through the public education system here um, in the 60s and 70s. So that's what I spend time on. I'm busy here today with Lenny Mendoza where we need to take a quick break and we'll be right back after these messages. Grandpa, can we do chemistry? Papa, daddy. Grandpa, let's do something fun. We'll help you stay organized so you can focus on what really matters in life. Give us a call today and see how we can help you start saving taxes. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm busy here today with Lenny Bendosa. And, and Lenny, in the first segment, we talked about the numerous causes and charities and nonprofits you organize, you're, you're involved with. But uh, in the area of education, uh, you made a comment about uh, working with the education sector today to try to, try to restore the opportunities that we had, uh, your generation had as a child that are missing today. And what, what is the gap? So um, start with a uh, coincidence and I'm not, it's not causal, but I graduated from high school the year Proposition 13 was passed in California. And that was a, a, a time where California public higher education in particular was at its peak. We had a very fully invested K to 12 system. We had a higher education system, which was the, and still is the envy of the world. Uh, it had, we have a California master plan that was written to describe a really visionary view about how do we ensure that every child has a pathway to community college, those who want to, to four year in CSU system or the university of California. And that is a huge piece of why California has been so successful and many other states and parts of the world have, have emulated that. Uh, I think the challenge now is not that we need to rewrite a master plan or that we need to just throw everything out. What we need to do is modernize it for the environment we're in. I think what's missing is a couple of things in particular. Number one, uh, we have an assumption that your education is done when you're a teenager and in your 20s and then you spend the left rest of your life earning. You, uh, you learn early and you earn late. I don't think that's the world we're gonna be in. So we need to imagine a post-secondary education system that is, is in the world that we are in, not the world that we used to be in. And that means people are gonna have to learn and earn at the same time and continually have lifelong learning. And that's really a, uh, an exciting opportunity. It's a challenge, but it's exciting. Uh, the opportunity to say that what you can do is not assume that you have to make a career choice when you're 18 and nothing's ever going to change, but that you can learn a set of skills and relearn new things to keep yourself excited and energized throughout your life. That's going to require a different way to think about our education system, particularly our post-secondary education system. The second thing that we're really going to need to be explicit about and cognizant of is that we have a different population that is entering our public education system in this state. They are mostly first generation Californians. There is a large, the largest portion of the um, post-secondary education in this state are people who are first generation college goers. Many of them have economic challenges. Some of them didn't start with English as their first language. We just have to be cognizant that we have to have a system that is prepared and, and invest the kind of capabilities and learning pathways that let those let the, the population that is California the future succeed in the way that it did when I went through the system. We've seen in recent uh, years uh, organizations like Google and Facebook saying, you know, look, I'm not sure we need you to have a college degree coming to work for us. What message is that sending? I, I think what um, the college is still post-secondary education, whether it's four-year or two-year or increasingly different kinds of certificates, um, are a really good investment for most people. And so to be able to say to people that you don't ever have to learn anything after high school is just misleading for most people. I think the more honest answer is you ought to expect to be learning for your entire life. 
And if it turns out that part of what you want to do means that you want to go work after high school before going on to post-secondary, I think that's great. But to assume that you know everything that you're ever going to need to know when you're 18 and the rest of your life is just applying that, that's not the world we live in. Great answer. So I'm busy here today with Lenny Mendoza, and I need to take another break, and we'll be right back after these messages. Grandpa, we found a golden stone. We have to watch out for the treasure guardian. Oh no, the treasure guardian! Since you can't take your wealth with you, spend time with your family. Groco, servicing family office needs since 1964. Welcome back. I'm visiting here today with Lenny Mendoza, and we were talking about the education system mm-hmm. today. And uh, Lenny, to you, what does the California dream mean? You know, there are different ways that people define that. To me, I, I look at it a very simple way, which is do my children have a high likelihood of having a better life than I did. And so, you know, it's been the American dream, the California dream, that if you came here, you worked hard, you were gonna have a good living. And in fact, the world was gonna progress and it was gonna be even better for you than it was for your parents. And historically, that has been true. If you were, according to um, Professor Raj Chetty, who's now at Harvard, was at Stanford and did the work at Stanford, that if you were a 30-year-old Californian in 1980, there was a 92% chance that you were earning more than your parents. If you're 30 years old today, that probability is a coin flip. So we can't have an expectation that there's only a coin flip about whether your life is going to be better than your parents or your kids are going to have a worse life than you. That's not the California dream. That's not the American dream. So to me, you can define it in a lot of different ways, but at its fundamental level, it's about are you going to have a good life and a pass on a better life to your children? Do you feel the California dream is gone or can we restore it? I think it's challenged um, and we can absolutely restore it and we have to. Uh, it's fundamental to the pioneer spirit. It's fundamental to a view about Americans being optimistic and Californians being on the frontier of that optimism. And we have to deliver it. And I think the, ch- the challenge are about ensuring that everyone, not just those who happen to have born, been born into privilege or having been born in parts of the geography like where we are now in Silicon Valley, where there's a lot of wealth, that opportunity to be available to everyone, not just those people who are born in, in, uh, in the right zip codes um, or to the right family. And I think that's really at its first level about creating opportunities for people to learn and earn. And so we have to ensure that the education system, as we were talking about earlier, really works. And we have to ensure if you have challenges along the way that our safety net works. And we have to ensure that we have high quality jobs going forward that pay people that are working so that they can afford to live here. Um, And then finally, we are going to have to lower the cost of living in California. It is just not acceptable that largely because of the cost of housing and the transit that gets you around to where the jobs and housing are, that a single mom in San Francisco would have to work three 40-hour-a-week jobs at the minimum wage just to afford life's basic needs. That's just not acceptable. So we have to do all of those things. Can we do that? I think we can. What does uh, what does a new California governor legislature have to do with with helping us to get the California dream in place? Is it a political solution, or is it a capitalistic solution? Um, yes, it is both. So the solutions to ensuring the California dream works are, in many ways, driven by the private sector and the, the intersection with the social sector to ensure that the jobs are there. Housing isn't built by government. There's a portion of it that's funded and reinforced that way. Um, The ensuring that jobs are high quality and that people have access to them, those are private sector challenges. They have to connect, private sector has to connect with the education system to make sure that they're they're providing the right kind of learning for the future of work. Um, But government has a huge role in this as well. And uh, as the fifth largest economy in the country, 
um, there is no excuse for California not being on the forefront of these issues. And so the new governor and the new legislature have a really important task to say that this is important. It is not, by the way, a partisan issue. Uh, if you poll Californians about the most important things on their mind and ask them a set of solution space, they don't necessarily break on partisan lines on these issues. There's no one who doesn't who wants their children to have a worse life than they did. It's a matter of how, and that's a political will problem. Do you feel that this is just a liberal fantasy? You know, the nice thing about this issue is that the most, some of the most aggressive people who are arguing that we need, we need to renew this, this dream are conservative Republicans. And they're doing it under a belief that this is the American way. You know, we have been a, and it's the California way, we've had a history of enabling people who work hard to earn a good living and have a better, better opportunity to um, enjoy life. And, um, but we may not, liberals and conservatives may not agree on exactly the right solution space, but been in a very large number of conversations where the issue around economic opportunity and economic mobility, the most aggressive voice in the rooms are conservative Republicans. In today's world of technology, and we hear all sorts of things about AI, how is that impacting the ability for our children to be critical thinkers? So I think the whole range of technology, including there's a lot of conversation around AI and robotics these days, um, are you know a fundamental element of the way we exist and the way we're going to exist going forward. To date, they've been applied in arenas that haven't had as large a societal impact as they will going forward. I'm not a tech. I'm not a tech. Um, I'm not a believer in the robot apocalypse is coming. I'm not scared of all of this. I think what we have to do is make sure that it is applied both for business good and for public good. So I'll give you an example of one that I'm most excited about. We are only beginning to understand how human beings learn and being able to adapt how we teach and encourage that being informed by technology. So I don't just mean that we've put people in front of an iPad and let them learn themselves, but I think you know, if you've been in a classroom with 30 kids, they don't learn the same way. And we now have an opportunity to tailor those learning experiences for how individuals learn. That to me is a great application of intelligence for good and technology for good. If one wants, wants to get involved with the California Dream and the initiative that you're working on, how would they go about? So the California Economic Summit that I mentioned happens every year. It will happen in November next year in Fresno. It's open to the public. And it has, last year we had 500 people there from all swaths of state of California geographically and by sector, and we'd encourage people to come and participate in it. All that information is available on the web that's coming out of it. Um, secondly, a group of us set up an entity, and, and not, a, not an entity, a movement called the Economic Mobility Collaborative. It's economicmobilityca.org that you can sign on to a letter that encourages the focus on ensuring that we have the California dream and that we measure it and ensure that it's it's successful. So those are a couple of places that people could go. I've been visiting here with, today with Lenny Mendoza, and uh, unfortunately we're out of time, but I appreciate you being here. And uh, uh, once again, give uh, the information for reaching out and contacting on the California initiative, how a person will go about that. So that's California Forward, caeconomy.org is the California Economic Summit. And there's a huge amount of resource there on what's going on in the California economy, how we can make it better. And there is the Economic Mobility Collaborative, which um, is economicmobilityca.com. It's an open letter to encourage and agree to a set of principles about the importance of achieving the California dream. And there's a lot of resources there. Lenny, thanks for being on today's show. My pleasure. Thank you.